Amen. If you brought your Bible this morning, I invite you to pull it out or grab a pew Bible there and find the book of Ecclesiastes. This will be fun for Bible drills. See if you can find Ecclesiastes. It goes uh, Psalms and Proverbs you can probably find, and then it's right after that. So Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Find Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And I'll share with you um, this, this book of the Bible. Uh, it's a part of the wisdom literature within the Old Testament. So as a lot of uh, a lot of things for how to live life, wise ways of living. And, and uh, Ecclesiastes speaks a lot about things that it says are meaningless. These things that, that if we strive after them, we'll end up longing and left feeling empty. And so read this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 7 with me. I'll be reading from the message translation, so it might be a little different than what you have in your hand there. It's also on the screen behind me. He says, I turned my head and saw yet another wisp of smoke on its way to nothingness. A solitary person, completely alone. No children, no family, no friends, yet working obsessively late into the night. Compulsively greedy for more and more. Never bothering to ask, why am I working like a dog? Never having any fun. And who cares? More smoke, a bad business. It's better to have a partner than to go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. Two in, in a bed warm each other. Alone you shiver all night. By yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. Would you pray with me?
God, we come to this space and this place for we recognize that emptiness in our soul that only can be filled by you. We come here with hopes of what you will do. And so, God, please speak into us. Speak words of life, words of hope, words of renewal and transformation. Oh, God, convict us by your word and then make us new so that we could go and change this world. God, help us to be those who are giving ourselves away, those who are giving so that others may find life and that abundance of living water as well. Oh God, send that water into us through the hearing of your word, through your speaking to us. We pray and we give ourselves to you at this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, all of God's people pray and together we say, amen, amen. You know, some of us might read this scripture and think, okay, I got it. God is telling us, God is saying, get married quick. <laughs> do, do a dugger and, and have lots and lots and lots of babies. I mean, we could interpret this scripture as, as that, as, as, as get married quick and have lots and lots of babies. But, but my friends, let me say this from the very beginning. That is not what this scripture is about, okay? It's not about that. That's far too simple, of an understanding, and frankly, it's, it's bad advice for some of us, okay? So instead, instead, this scripture is speaking about our need for connectedness. It's speaking about our, our human, our, our Christian, our human need for relationship, for being in community together, that need for something deeper, Deeper than ourselves, deeper than just a hello on the street, but a need for some kind of relationship that gives life. Y'all, I have 1,420 friends on Facebook. 1,420 friends, and yet sometimes I still feel lonely. 1,420 closest relations, and yet I sometimes still feel depressed. Can anybody relate? Ecclesiastes is a super uplifting book sometimes. It describes a number of meaningless things that we can do, meaningless things that we can pursue and chase after with our lives, these, these wisps of smoke, as it said, or this, this dust in the wind. And it really cuts close to home. It really speaks to who we are today. You know, if, if Ecclesiastes was written today, I'm sure, I'm certain that this would have been added. I saw another meaningless thing. Another meaningless thing, hundreds of followers on Twitter, thousands of friends on Facebook, millions of likes on Instagram, but in the end, meaningless, meaningless. That's the gist of Ecclesiastes. It, it speaks about what we do, what we give our lives and give ourselves to, the things that we pursue that will leave us wanting, that will leave us empty, that will leave us longing, that will leave us lonely. Here in chapter 4, it picks up with, with work, 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 burning the midnight oil, putting in the long hours, pushing for that promotion, socking away for retirement, all these things that seem like they're so good, so essential, so critical, but he says it's all meaningless. You know, my wife Michelle often reminds me about the hours I spend here in this place and the hours that I'm not spending with my children. You know, because you know, that's how it works. When we spend time in one place, we are taking it from another place. I remember my own father writing me a letter about 15 years ago. He wrote me and my brother and sister each a, an individual letter. And in that letter, I could hear the lament in his words. The lament for the times that he had not been there, that he had been at work or doing other things. It's something that seems to persist throughout generations and all the way back, stretching back to the very beginning of time. We work and we work because we need to. But Ecclesiastes warns us that, that our working and our striving and our searching and our hoping for this or that may end up leaving us lonely 
and alone. I know, I know that y'all have heard this before, but, but research says that we need eight to ten meaningful touches every day. We need, you and I, as, as people, we need eight to ten meaningful, significant touches. Well done. I, I, I love that people are listening and touching each other. Eight to ten significant touches every day in order to be physically well. Those are touches. I think that's, it's also a soul thing because I think our soul needs this as well. Our soul needs eight to ten touches, touches that will soak in and water our soul. Doesn't seem like very many, does it? My friends, there are people who are still struggling to get that. There are people in our world, there are people right here in this sanctuary who are, who are thirsty and hungry for that longing for those eight to ten touches in a day. Uh, you know, on the other hand, though, my iPhone tells me that I pick it up 57 times per day. 57 times per day I pull this out of my pocket. Research also says that the average person touches his or her cell phone 2,617 times per day. And yet we're struggling. We are struggling for 8 to 10 meaningful interpersonal touches per day. Y'all know that's, that's why I ask you to hold hands at the benediction. You realize that's why we ask you to to get up and get out of your pew and go find somebody, hug somebody, shake somebody's hand. You realize that's, that's why I stand at the back doors and shake hands and give hugs is because some of us aren't getting that. And we need it. Our souls need it. Our bodies need it. We are we are lonely and alone. We have 1,400 friends on Facebook. We touch our phones 2,600 times per day, and yet we are alone. We are lonely. And I'll tell you, our society doesn't help us any. We, we are a far more mobile society today. Our, our children move far away. Our, our friends take promotions. They relocate halfway across the country. Our, our families scatter across the globe. We are incredibly busy And it's harder and harder to make the time to get together and to to share that time together. You know, we used to share multi-generational houses, but now we value our privacy. We we want our own space. We, We don't want anybody else up in our business. And yet Ecclesiastes warns us that we are playing with wisps of smoke. However... However, my friends, God has a solution for us today. God has a solution for that loneliness and that longing. And it's something that Jesus modeled with his disciples. It's something that that the prophet Elijah gave to the prophet Elisha. It's something that Moses passed on to Joshua. It's something that that the priest Eli modeled for Samuel. It's something that that the apostle Paul did for Timothy. It's it's something that happens throughout time and throughout Scripture. And, And if you read between the lines in our Bibles, you find it over and over again happening again and again because it's something that's important to our faith. And that something is discipleship to use a churchy word. That something is mentoring, to use the sociological word. But at its core, it is relationship. It's consistent, reliable relationship that helps another individual grow, that passes on wisdom and knowledge and encouragement to somebody younger, somebody who's not as far along, somebody who needs that from somebody else. Think, I think that that's why this scripture is talking about what it's talking about. I think that's what it's saying, that it's better to have a partner. It's better to have somebody else than go it alone. If, if one falls, the other helps. Two can warm each other. With a friend, you can face the worst. A three-stranded sta- rope, if you can get a couple, a three-stranded rope is not easily snapped. You know, as people of faith, we're called together by God called to help each other. But simply as human beings, this is what our bodies and our souls require. Now, I'm not going to lie. 
This may sound super easy, but it's not. It's not something that just happens accidentally. It's not something that just appears, but it requires an intentionality. It requires a focus and, and, and a purpose of doing it. it requires ourselves. It requires time and, and energy and intentionality, and it will probably require touching our phone a little bit less. But this discipleship, these mentoring relationships, this giving ourselves away is what our souls are longing for. It's what your heart is crying out for. So how do we do this? I'm going to give you a few things, very easy things. If you want to write them down, you can jot them down in your bulletin there. But, but three steps for mentoring, for discipling, for, for making this relationship happen. And these may seem very simple, but here's what it is. Number one, it starts with presence. Be there. Show up. Time and time again. It, be there. Be present. I, 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 and I had, to, I had to actually put a recurring reminder on my phone. Otherwise, it didn't happen. I had to have my phone remind me every week, oh, I'm supposed to be here with this person because it's important. You have to schedule that time. But that showing up, showing up is an expression of love. So the second thing, once you've showed up for a while, the second thing is this, is to, number two, is simply ask questions. You know, sometimes when we get into a relationship with somebody else, we, we don't know what to say, especially if it's with somebody that's different. I remember working in, in the black church, and I, and I used to have these questions that would come up in my mind, and I was so afraid to ask because I thought, am I going to be perceived as racist? Is, is this going to be received the right way? But something I learned was that when I kept showing up, when I kept investing in that relationship, that when I asked those questions, they knew my heart. And so it wasn't received that way. as usually received with a, a, a load of grace. So first of all, show up, be present. Second of all, ask questions. Third of all, be you. Be who you are. Don't be anybody else, but, but better yet, be the best version of you because you are somebody that others are looking to, that others are modeling their lives after. The children in this church look at you and they decide, how important is this? What is church about? Is it something where I, I just come when I feel like it or I come when it's convenient? Or is it something that for some reason these people keep making time? What is it that we want to pass on to this next generation? Therefore, we live the best versions of ourselves so that they will inherit those gifts from us. That's what discipleship is. Wednesday morning, I was sitting at Chick-fil-A and my phone rang for the second time and so I picked it up and my wife was on the other end of the line and her voice was shaking and she could barely get the words out. She said, Sean, you need to get to Micah's house as soon as you can. She said, one of the young men just passed away. These men at Micah's house, men who don't have a place to live, don't have a family, have come out of the foster care system, are dealing with so much. They have struggles that I can't even understand. But here's the bad part. They're wrestling with these things without the stability of a dependable family. They're wrestling without, with these things without a settled home. They're wrestling with these struggles without a financial safety net and, and insurance from their parents and, and caring people that will be a reliable, consistent presence in their lives. There, there's a couple of people who work at Micah's house, volunteer their time, but, but for the most part, they're all by themselves 
in this world dealing with all this stuff. And now, now, this week, just this week, a second one of their peers has been torn out of their lives. And they feel, I know, like they've got nobody. And I think about this scripture, I think about what the, what the Bible says to us, that, that it talks about a solitary person completely alone with no partner, no one to help him up when he falls. Church, these men need more than our thoughts and prayers. They need more than just people thinking about them sometimes. They need more than people offering a prayer for them occasionally. They need people that will do that, yes, but they need people who will then show up for them as well. They need men and women who will mentor them, men and women who will cry with them, men and women who will say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. They need people who will spend time with them, who will show them that they care. We can have 1,400 friends. We can have a good job and a good life. Or we can have the life that God designed us for. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we pray for the hurting among us. We pray for the loneliness in our souls. And for the times when we've prayed that you would heal that, we recognize that you are giving us the answer to go and give ourselves away. Oh God, make us strong strong enough to follow in this path of discipleship for you have called us to leave our nets and to come and to follow. You've called us to live the life that you lived, calling others along as well. And so God, I pray for a new move of your spirit in us today. God, help us to be those who are not afraid, to be those who are not too busy, to be those who go to make a difference where death has caused a darkness. God, Send your light through us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen. So my invitation today is this. Be a mentor. And I don't, there's some um, flyers outside if you're interested in doing that through Micah's house or through Saving Grace for the women's, or through Big Brothers, Big Sisters, those are all out there. Or look for one of the children in this church. These kids need mentors. I want to ask everybody to think and to pray for just a couple minutes and to write a name on your bulletin. Who will you mentor? Write a name or write an organization because this is something that every one of us need. Not just for them, but for ourselves as well. So that's my invitation today, is to pray and to listen to God. Who is it that God has put in your life that you are called to mentor and to serve and to give your life for them? If you'd like to join this church to become a part of a community, a family where we struggle together, where we help each other, where we choose to touch and to give each other what God says we need, then I invite you to come right now. If you'd like to give your life to God, to pray about anything, we'll be down front. This is your opportunity to say yes to what God is leading you to do. Let's all stand. Let's sing. Let's give our voices and our hearts to God.